When it comes to people's opinions on movies, we live in an era of extremes. A film is either the best thing ever, or it's an abomination that any right-minded human should be ashamed of liking. But when it comes down to it, what exactly makes those bad films worthy of that hate? One clunky performance, a handful of cheesy lines, a smattering of familiar plot points? And perhaps more importantly, is there found beneath that egregious element something missed? Something good? Something actually worth our time? Maybe, maybe not. But let's find out together. Welcome to Film Negative. Guillermo del Toro once famously described Christopher Nolan as an emotional mathematician, an assessment that I wholeheartedly concur with, but also not one that I necessarily find to be negative. Nolan's filmmaking style, his formula has genuinely moved me numerous times. So if I were to, for example, dig into and dissect films like Memento, Batman Begins, The Prestige, The Dark Knight, Inception, or Dunkirk, I'd find beneath the surface of each of those films such a controlled, calculated, and measured style of storytelling. These storytelling equations, if you'd like. But again, while it might seem that this mathematical approach would produce films that were cold and unfeeling, Nolan's storytelling equations and filmmaking formulas have in fact been able to conjure up quite the opposite. Films that have swept me off my feet, transporting me emotionally just as much as intellectually. And therein lies my primary issue with this third and final entry in the director's Batman trilogy, The Dark Knight Rises those carefully calibrated storytelling mechanics that made nearly every other of his films so astounding were indeed present in this film, but seen and felt in a way that pulled against a wholly immersive experience. If The Dark Knight Rises were some fancy dish, rather than enjoying a cohesive piece of culinary brilliance, each ingredient that comprised that dish unhelpfully drew attention to itself, again, degrading the holistic experience. And there were indeed so many ingredients in The Dark Knight Rises, to the extent that at times it felt as unnaturally augmented as the film's leading villain. With all that said, the ingredients found in any Chris Nolan film, this one included, are still so incredibly tasty and absolutely worth discussing and praising. So let's do just that. Now, while there is simply no way that I can, in a reasonable amount of time, analyze every one of this film's successful elements, from its outstanding acting, Maybe it's time we all stop trying to outsmart the truth and let it have its day. To awe-inspiring practical action set pieces. I did want to take a few minutes to highlight the incredible amount of thought and effort that Chris and his brother Jonathan clearly put into crafting this film's underlying themes on the page. Themes that the filmmakers went on to display in the production design, cinematography, choreography, and musical score. To start things off though, we have to recognize that after the success of Batman Begins and The Dark Knight, Nolan was in a corner. One that he put himself in, sure, but in a corner nonetheless. Just like escalation had been a central theme in his previous two Batman films, the hero's very existence leading to bigger and badder criminals, so too had the escalation in scope scale and quality between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight led to this demand that Nolan himself increase things all the more, in all departments, in this his final installment. And while he did indeed grow things to this apocalyptic scale by the film's finale, Nolan brilliantly did not start it there. Instead, after the opening show-stopping midair heist, things got quiet really quiet, and stayed that way for nearly 45 minutes. And that, along with the eight-year time jump between the events of this film and those in The Dark Knight, was such an inspired choice on the filmmaker's part, as it allowed the actions at the end of the previous film to maintain their meaning and significance. Batman's sacrifice had made a difference and had brought about change. Big change. One that had lasted for an extended period of time. 
This city is without organized crime because the Dent Act gave law enforcement teeth in its fight against the mob. Not only that, but withholding Batman himself from a Batman film for a third of its runtime also began to beautifully reveal, again, what I want to focus on most in this episode, that being this film's central theme, its core. Nolan constructed The Dark Knight Rises to be about Bruce Wayne post-Batman. I'm still a believer in the Batman, even if you're not. He began the trilogy by poignantly showing us that individual pre-Batman, and now, to close things out, he was very interested in exploring what he looked like after the cape and cowl were hung up. You haven't been down here in a long time. What would that existence look like? How would that existence be achieved? And could it be sustained? Well, at the start of the film, Mr. Wayne's prospects certainly weren't shown to look all that promising. I cannot recommend that you go hella skiing, Mr. Wayne. Again, by pushing off for so long the Caped Crusader's return, we got to experience one possible version of a Batman-less Bruce Wayne. You hung up your cape and your cow, but you didn't move on. You never went to find a life. A man without purpose, broken beyond repair, a dried up addict who had given his life to the drug of anger, rage, guilt, and fear, and now had nothing left. There's nothing out there for me. And like I already mentioned, Nolan didn't simply communicate that through expository dialogue, but through every cinematic tool at his disposal. Lost Wayne. Just look at the production design of Wayne Manor, for example. Even while Bruce had had it reconstructed, its relayed bricks only amounted to a shell, one that its owner refused to fill once again with life. And worse still, the life that was within its walls was slowly fading away a feeling that was seen and felt in its empty chambers and whitewashed walls. Nolan also communicated that idea on an even larger scale with his treatment of the whole of Gotham City. By taking the fall for Harvey Dent at the end of The Dark Knight, Bruce Wayne had indeed given the city a veneer of health and stability, but not in a way that completely removed the infection of injustice and class segregation, which ended up being the very weakness that Bane himself exploited. And we give it back to you, the people. So, in the same way that Wayne Manor was made a cold, unfeeling white, so too was Gotham blanketed by that same color. All the while, beneath it, things continued to fester and rot. How fitting then that Bane and his mercenaries quite literally took over Gotham's sewer system, infecting that city from the inside out. And while we're on the topic of Bane, though the character never ascended to the heights of the Joker or even Ra's al Ghul, we are back to finish the job. For the exact same reasons we've been discussing, he really was the right choice of adversary for this film, who he was as a character lining up perfectly with the same themes and ideas that we've been discussing. I will let them believe that they can survive so that you can watch them clambering over each other to stay in the sun. Like Batman himself, he, with much theatricality, masqueraded as one thing, that being this ferocious and fearless dictatorial leader. Now we come here not as conquerors, but as liberators. But in actuality, beneath that facade, he was this broken and scared child, longing for something or someone to heal him and give him a higher purpose. His only crime was that he loved me. Jim Gordon, Miranda Tate, and Selena Kyle also began this film buried beneath their own fictions, pains, and past. To plunge their hands into the filth so that you can keep yours clean. Even Joseph Gordon-Levitt's goody-goody character was designed to be one thing on the outside and another on the inside. It's like putting on a mask. On the outside, he was but a rookie cop named John Blake, but hidden beneath that, he was quite literally Robin. So, after establishing those facades, those tunnels, and those pits that all that brokenness and fear was hidden in and behind, Nolan then spent the rest of the film, you guessed it, showing the characters, at least attempting to rise out of them. And here again, it wasn't just expository dialogue that the filmmaker used to communicate that movement upwards. Rather, everything from this film's production design, to the choreography, to Hans Zimmer's brilliant score, Rose. Impossible. A nuclear physicist was pulled up out of a plane. Bruce Wayne climbed up out of a pit. Bane's army rose from the sewers. Selena Kyle ascended out of poverty. 
Batman took flight in a bat plane. A fusion reactor turned nuclear weapon was drawn up from under a river. The Moroccan Arabic lyrics from the film's central theme could literally be translated. Rise. John Blake was lifted up on a platform. Ultimately, though, it wasn't just that Nolan and company crafted a film with really tasty ingredients, where its component parts, its themes, its narrative, and its visuals were engaging, but he made sure that those themes, that narrative, and those visuals were right for a final chapter in a series. And one of the reasons that we know they were right is that they led to something so uncommon in today's big budget blockbuster. That being, they led to finality conclusion, a period rather than an ellipsis. This Batman story began with the character falling into a well and developing this debilitating fear. Which meant that when he at last climbed out of that hole and let go of that fear, the story was done. And by letting go of his need for Batman, by permanently rising above that part of himself, Bruce Wayne's Batman finally achieved the status that Ra's al Ghul hinted at so long ago. Legend, Mr. Wayne. But even more interesting than simply inspiring John Blake to don that old cape and cowl was the inspiration that that legend gave to the people of Gotham, and by extension, to us the viewer. I see a beautiful city and a brilliant people rising from this abyss. It was saying that we don't need to be a billionaire or someone trained in the martial arts to rise up and do the right thing. No, what's more important is the bravery to shed our own facades and expose our own demons to the light of love, which rises like a purifying sun. And it's for all these reasons that I believe this film is worth that second look. And there we have it. There is absolutely so much more that I can praise about this film and also so much more that I could critique and criticize, but we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much to everyone that voted over on Twitter, letting me know that this was the film you wanted me to explore this month. I think I'll post another poll over there pretty soon for next month's film as well. But in the meantime, definitely comment below and let me know what other films you want me to explore here with this show. Until next time though, guys, I'm Chris Hartwell, and this was Film Negative. Cheers.